Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming on this beautiful day. So Julien Chapuis' talk has just demonstrated how much more sophisticated our, our vision of sculptures has become. Only recently, in the last quarter of the 20th century, the colored appearance of sculptures received surprisingly little attention. In the past, the appreciation of sculptures generally favored the formal description of volumes, of carving skills, of figures' expression, and the iconographical meaning or historical significance of objects. The first steps towards an understanding of sculpture's surfaces with detailed investigation of the paint layers were made in the 1960s. Initiatives came from the field of conservation and over the years evolved into a, a collaboration between curators, conservators, and scientists. The understanding of the condition of a work of art, the question of the age of the visible surfaces, the question whether the actual appearance was originally intended or the result of later changes has now become of prime importance. In this talk, I would like to clarify these points. I will first give a brief review of the history of color found on medieval sculptures, focusing solely on stone and wooden examples. I will then discuss the condition of actual sculptures at the cloisters and the various reasons for their changes in appearance. I will finally address the treatment of sculptures and the considerations taken to improve their appearance. As seen in the previous talk, sculptures have been painted from the earliest periods in ancient Egypt and throughout the ancient world. In the Middle Ages, through the use of paint and other colored materials, formidable amounts of sculptures were produced with a desire to create illusion of life with sculpted forms. For the medieval viewer, the precious blues, the gold-like decorations and royal, and royal stones applied on surfaces of sculptures increased the figure's aura and physical presence, breathing life into the sculptures, transforming an artful creation into an object of wonder and often veneration. Here on the right, we see a 13th century miniature from the Lambeth Apocalypse, depicting a Benedictine monk painting a carved figure of the enthroned virgin holding Christ's child. The artist monk, brush in one hand and oyster shell palette in the other, is miraculously bringing the virgin to life during the painting process. The literal liveliness of the Virgin recalls the Metropolitan Museum's 14th century Virgin of the Annunciation from northeast eastern Spain, uh, eastern France, excuse me. The substantial traces of polychromy and gilding suggest how much more dramatic and majestic the stone Virgin would have been when fully painting. You see all the traces of polychromy in these areas. Yep, so here. The primary materials out of which sculptures were carved would significantly influence the final aspect of the exterior painted layers. I just want to go through a brief recapitulation of the use of polychromy for stone and wooden medieval sculptures. During the Middle Ages, painting stone sculptures, either for outside monumental portals or interior sculptures, was common in Europe. In the Romanesque era, not all stone sculptures were painted. Many artistic centers would value the whiteness of marble or stone, reminiscent of some of the sculptures created in Roman antiquity, as demonstrated by Julien. However, some extensive traces of polychromy have been identified on sculptures dated to the 12th century, as on the Modena Cathedral choir screen in Italy that you see on the left. It is interesting to notice that the exterior portal of this same cathedral on the right, dated to 1106, was left unpainted. After around 1200, there's a definite upsurge in the use of paint on stone sculptures, particularly in the north of France near Paris. 
Recently, detailed examinations have uncovered traces of original polychromy of numerous exterior portals of French cathedrals, including Bourges, Angers, Notre Dame de Paris, Saint Lys, Notre Dame des Tentes, and others. Portals were either fully covered in paint and metal leaves or simply accented by color in certain passages, leaving the rest unpainted. Here we see on the right a detail of the seated figure of Christ on, a, on Amiens Cathedral. Um, it's on the west facade, um, and you have a view of the overall west facade on the left. In this portal, no traces of paint were found on the columns, capitals, and quadrilobes, but all other elements of the facade were painted. The figure of Christ was one of the areas on the portals displaying many traces of paint, with on the face clear remnants of a warm brown in the hair and an intense blue gaze underlined by black. Traces of azurite and vermilion were located on Christ's mantle and robe, and Christ is right over there. Um, actually, here you see a, a, a view of the, of the face of Christ after the cleaning of that cathedral. Um, and maybe the, the balance of all the polychromy is a, somewhat lost in that you have a really uh, very well-preserved gaze uh, with this intense blue. And the rest of the face, you see the ochre tone of the limestone, which perhaps is, would not have been as visible uh, when fully painted. On this early 13th century choir screen of the Church of Santa Maria in Vezzolano, Italy, the paint layers complete the sculpted program. They refine or accent details carved in the support, add certain elements not indicated in stone, such as the angel's wings, and generally aid legibility of the figures, uh, notably by offsetting them with a painted background. Two outstanding examples of stone figures fully painted enrich the cloisters collection. And you have seen some of them in the, in the prior talk, but I will um, go back to them in more detail. Um, the Strasbourg Virgin, dated to, to circa 1250, is carved out of light pink sandstone. The sculpture was protected from the elements by being located on the cathedral's choir screen inside, and much of the original paint layers have survived. The surface was mostly gilt, with the exception of the white collar, all the way up there, white headscarf, and possibly the, co the cloak lining, also white. And today you see a red lining, but um, originally it, had been, it was white. The gold leaf was further decorated on the Virgin's mantle with alternating green and red glazes visible on the jewels prominently carved on its borders. And perhaps it's a little difficult to see, but here you have a, green, um, a red glaze, and then on the next one you'll have a green glaze. And um, of course, this is a, again a green gla a red glaze here, and it's much more visible um, under a microscope. The Virgin's robe was originally gilt as well, but now presents a blue layer painted at a later date, as mentioned by Julien. And here you have a cross section in the central image um, with the blue blue azurite that you see, which is the overpaint. And here is the original gold leaf layer that is on a mordant layer or substrate that maintains the gold leaf on the surface. And here you have the ground of the sculpture or the preparation layer. I will come back later on and talk um, on the subject of cross sections. The flesh tones on the sculpture are warm pink with stronger reds on the lips and cheeks. And all in all, the polychromy plays a greater role than just decorative. The abundant use of gold underscores the regal nature of the Virgin, while the warmth of the flesh tones makes her humanity more tangible. The standing Virgin and Child at the cloisters again is carved in the, in the style of Parisian sculptures from, a, from about 1340. The sculpture retains most of its original paint and gilding and appears today close to how it would have in the 14th century. The Virgin's azurite blue mantle is embellished with a stencil pattern of gilded crests. 
The lining of the cloak was white with black imitation fur detail in the style of present nobility. Her robe is less well preserved, but traces of original layers suggest that it was gilt and perhaps glazed. The child's robe is red with a stencil pattern of five petal gilded flowers. Um, it was a little more difficult to photograph these. They're not um, as in good condition as the stencil pattern that you see on the Virgin's mantle. The Virgin's crown, as well as the borders of the Virgin's cloak, the collars of the Virgin's dress and the child's robe are all embellished with gilded reliefs set with colored semi-precious stones. And you see that on this um, detail of the robe and the borders. And you have, maybe not in, the, in this image, but there's a slight relief um, in the gesso in the border. And then you have these um, beautiful um, stones that are set in into the gesso and maintained into the gesso, and you have them all over the sculpture, uh, all over the borders of the sculpture in here. As opposed to stone, not always polychromed or fully polychrome, wooden sculptures were traditionally entirely enhanced by bright paint layers throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Middle Ages until at least the end of the 15th century. The way a carved wooden figure was polychromed would have changed its character completely. At first, in the Romanesque era, facial details remain linear, yet bring soul to Christ's downcast eyes on the cloisters as to Dio crucifix, a 12th century wooden polychrome sculpture from the convent of Santa Clara at Astudio near Palencia, Spain. So uh, here you have a detail of um, the face, of course, um, with these amazing um, accentuations of the, of the features of Christ and the eyes really underscored in black. Um, the main body of Christ has lost most of its polychromy. Um, what is uh, fabulous being a conservator is that we are able to see the back of sculptures and actually the back of the Perizonium displays a wonderfully well-preserved polychromy um, in lapis lazuli blue, blue. And also the back of the cross um, represents a figure of the Lamb of God. Um, and you have really amazing details of these um, raised relief decorations on the cross, which are glazed with a green, red, and blue alternating. Um, and this actually, this, this part of the cross is, um, is on a metal leaf, and it's uh, painted in, with, a, with a green um, glaze, now has darkened. Towards the Gothic era, flesh tones are depicted to convey more realistic effects in line with the greater naturalism of the sculptural forms. To do so, increasingly sophisticated painting techniques are used. In this early 16th century reliquary head of a female saint, the artist exploits the translucency, gloss, and malleability of oil paints to depict fine details, such as individual hair of eyebrows and lashes. Here, paint produces astonishing lifelike expression, conveying emotions such as the saint's feelings, which transpire through the reddening corners of her eyes. And you see that, these red details. As for flesh tones, one can, one can trace an evolution in the increasingly sophisticated techniques used for the reproduction of sumptuous contemporary vestments pearls, beads, gems, and cabochons, which studied the borders of actual garments in the Middle Ages. Although Romanesque polychromy in good condition is, ex is exceedingly rare, the Metropolitan Museum's Sedes Sapiensiae, or Enthroned Virgin and Child, from 12th century Auvergne in France, exhibits traces of an original relief decoration on the Virgin's sleeve, representing alternating diamonds and circles. The decorations would have been much more prominent at the time of their creation as they were originally intended to look like gold. They are produced with tin leaf on a gesso, on a gesso relief, which would have been covered with a yellow glaze. And so here they are, these decorations. The, here you see a round and a diamond shape. This, the discovery of these tin relief decorations on this sculpture date, dating to the 12th century is actually a revelation to the history um, of techniques in that usually such decorations are found on 13th century 
mid to late 13th century sculptures. So finding such applied relief decorations on the 12th century is, is, a, is a real find. Um, Later in the Middle Ages, the application of prefabricated press bro brocades to imitate, it, to, to imitate the three-dimensional effects of contemporary textiles became more common, producing stunning results. The cloister's late 15th century Saint Barbara from Alsace retains much of its original paint layers with gilt wax brocades on the saint's red robe, a detail of which you see on the right, and scratched in floral decorations on the painted silver mantle here. The wax brocades are relief ornaments prepared in molds, which were engraved with a textile motif, then covered by a leaf of tin as a releasing agent. Small amounts of liquid ground material, or here wax, was then poured into the mold while lukewarm. After drying and removal from the mold, the decorations were glued onto the sculpture to be further gilded in place. The other textile imitation, the scratched in motif, is painted on, on um, this blue background, which actually has been analyzed at, as indigo, which is um, not a common dye one would find on a sculpture. Um, so it's just an interesting uh, technical point. Um, and here you see, uh, through the scratching of the paint, the silver leaf transpiring in this, on the surface and making these wonderful floral patterns. After this overview of the history of polychromy on stone and wooden sculptures, I will turn the discussion towards the present condition of sculptures in museums, their physical history, that is the question of the age of the visible surfaces. It is a misconception to think that objects look more or less the way they did when created, nor do they generally correspond to the original intention of their creators. Obvious damages are usually recognized, but there's a little understanding of the degree to which sculptures and other works in museums have been reworked to the taste of the ear, and the degree to which they have been cleaned and restored by museums in response to new findings or to make them more displayable. Now, a long list of possibilities explains the shifts in sculpture's appearance from their original aspect. I will name a few. At best, there is natural aging. Even in cases where the original surfaces are well preserved, they often do not correspond to the original appearance, since materials used have altered naturally due to chemical and physical changes. Perhaps the most well-known phenomenon is the tarnishing of silver leaf, which unprotected becomes black by oxidation. Some pigments and colorants fade with light, others turn black or shift in color, and varnishes or glazes usually become brown. Now the cloisters and throne virgin, virgin and child from Spain, you see fully on your left, is an example where the polychrome layers are almost intact and a sculpture, or at least polychromy, considered to be in choice condition for a late 13th century sculpture. Remarkable passages of enamel-like red glazes of, over silver leaf decorate the child's mantle with imitation fur details in the lining. So here you have this wonderful red glaze, and uh, maybe in the cracks of this glaze you see this gray uh, tone, which is um, a metal leaf, silver leaf. And the imitation fur detail you, you can um, slightly make sense of in this, in this part of the sculpture. The painter's free hand can still be sensed embellishing the virgin's belt on the right, while his steadiness and finesse is experienced through the painting of the virgin's eyebrows. The belt presents a silver leaf decorated a silver leaf that is decorated with black quadrifoil ornaments and a gilded bottom edged with a black fleur de lis ornament. Here's the gold and then the silver transpiring through the black paint. Upon close, closer investigation, we see that certain shifts in color balances, such as the Virgin's mantle, which appears gray today, and was originally meant to be a warm gold imitating the precious leaf through the use of fine silver leaf covered with a yellow glaze. So see here you see 
mostly a gray mantle. However, under a microscope, you see the remnants of this yellow glaze, which would have covered the silver leaf and would have given this so-called imitation gold. Most changes in sculptures are, however, voluntary. History's accidents, notably changes in religious beliefs, have often harmed medieval sculptures. Throughout the Middle Ages, the mimetic quality of colored sculptures, together with the sumptuousness of their ornamentation, was always problematic for the church. Both characteristics were closely linked to idolatry and the display of wealth at the expense of the poor. The movements ruined and defaced many sculptures along with their colored surfaces. And here you see an early 16th century stone sculpture of St. Michael, which was found in pieces, and you see all the different sections of the sculpture. And it was found in, in what is basically a sculpture's burial ground in Bern, Switzerland. The sculpture was once fully painted, measuring up to eight feet in height. And as you see on this 17th century manuscript page on the right, Bern was the center of, of an extensive Lutheran iconoclastic movement in the early 16th century, which destroyed many artworks. Even more disastrous, disastrous for polychrome sculptures has been the enduring movement of neoclassical taste that Julien uh, extensively talked about. Um, by the 19th century, restorers dutifully stripped original colors from surfaces in the name of honesty towards the material and antipathy towards color. Stone and ivory sculptures were washed, soaped, scrubbed, bleached, while wooden sculptures were dipped or covered in caustic solutions, even scraped of their layers of paint with sharp instruments. Here you see a late 15th century shrine at the cloisters representing the dormition or death of the Virgin. Um, the shrine was completely denuded of its paint layers. The, origin, the shrine originally had two wings also decorated with in painted low relief. So the wood was stripped, probably with a caustic solution. As you can see from here, you have a detail of the foot of one of the apostles here. Um, and you have the, the, grains, the grain of the wood, which are s slightly raised um, in here also. You have these damages made on the wood, and that is from the caustic solution applied to remove the paint layers. And this um, lower image, you have just the traces of polychromy uh, blue on the, on the white perforation layer that is in the corner of the shrine. Some sculptures were spared of the stripping, but were still adapted to the neoclassical taste or trend by painting the multi-layered, multi the multi-colored sculptures with a gray layer imitating stone. The 14th century standing virgin and child from Paris that you saw earlier in this talk, I, saw, I hope you recognize the stencil decoration, um, was herself painted in a, with this gray layer that you see here on the border of the image. Um, covering all the colors um, and um, imitating stone with this gray layer. In many other cases, sculptures were simply renovated throughout their history. That is, they were repainted to, changing, to adapt to changing taste and time. Overpainting sometimes closely fo followed or was sympathetic to the original scheme of colors. Most often, paint layers simply reflected the, the changing fashion of times or changing functions of a sculpture. The standing bishop at the cloisters, a sculpture attributed to Tilman Riemann Schneider, is an interesting example in case. At first glance, the polychromy appears to be medieval. The balance of colors, flesh tones, and garments seem to belong to the same period. On closer look, however, paint layers reveal several aspects which seem to be inconsistent with an early 16th century date. The decorative scheme of gold banding on a glazed silver garment is a little unusual for the period. Here. The gold leaf itself is very thin and small in size, more typically used in the 19th century. The flesh tone, the hair, the gloves, the white alb, here, the fringes of the cope, are, and the plinth as well, are all uh, unde undeniably overpainting layers, so they're not original layers. There's 
argument that the sculpture is an early 16th century of work of art with anachronistic paint layers dating to the 19th century. It is possible the sculpture was originally a so-called monochrome sculpture by Thiemann Riemann Schneider, an example of which you can see on the right with the cloisters box with standing virgin and child uh, attributed to Nicolas Gerhardt von Leiden, dated to circa 1470. I know, I'm not in the Middle Ages anymore. <laughs> Um, conservation practices are sometimes not readily understood by the general public. High-profile cases of cleaning works of art appear on the front pages of newspapers around the world. For example, the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel in Rome that you recognize here on the left was f famously controversial. However, regrettably, media reporting on these high-profile cases is often formulated in terms of controversy often neglecting more significant discoveries or achievement performed during the treatment of these works of art. As demonstrated in the last section of this talk, sculptures do not look the way they were created in the Middle Ages, and curators and conservators constantly need to turn their thoughts on the sculpture's presentation. Conservation practices begin only after meticulous studies of the various deteriorations in the support and surfaces of the multiple paint layers found on sculptures and only after an understanding of a sculpture's material history. Preliminary investigation of polychrome sculptures always begins with a detailed surface examination under a stereo microscope. The majority of the surfaces found on sculptures consists of a number of layers on top of each other, which are composed of different materials and consistencies. Normally, only the top layer is visible and in very specific cases, a stratigra stratigraphic window is opened to understand the aspect and condition of the various layers of paint. And on the top right here, well actually it's <laughs> the right complete, um, is one such stratigraphic windows. It was performed on the back of this St. John, uh, dated to the 16th century from South Netherlands. The window measures about one square inch. It's, it is done under a microscope with a very small scalpel. And it, what it does is that we delicately remove layer after layer of the history of overpainting campaigns, slowly coming back to the original paint layers um, on the bottom here. So that we understand what happened in the, in, in the various stages of the, of the sculpture. However, as you can understand, such windows are usually not performed on sculptures as um, they are a little obtrusive for the sculpture. In this case, we knew that the sculpture was gonna be, um, all, the, all these paint layers were gonna be removed, so this was just a historical document of the various stages of polychromy. <laughs> Most often, we perform what I already mentioned is cross-section analysis, um, which is an extraction of a small sample of paint from the sculpture. Um, the St. John here was painted 17 times during its, its existence, and here on the left you see the 17 layers of paint, starting from this original layer, and this is a dark green glaze on a, on a white preparation, and going all the way, that's number two, and here it was painted this red, and this is dirt layer, and red, blue, and up green, you know, going up to, up to, the, to the last yellow la layer that you see on the right. Um, and this is number 17 all the way up there. So these cross-sections help us understand what happened to the sculpture and also reveal the individual characters of the pigments used for each layers, an important aspect for the understanding and dating of painting techniques. This information that we we gather from um, cross-sections and, and all other uh, analysis is reproduced through a table, an inconclusive table, which gives you an overview of the, of the history of the sculpture. And what we do is that um, we take a sculpture and we uh, separate it in sections, so for the hair, the eye, the flesh, the robe, the interior of the robe, the exterior of the robe, and the mantle, interior, exterior, and then we just, uh, here, this is the original layer, and we go up and through centuries. And it's an interesting case, as you see the repainting of the eyes and the different um, 
the different uh, trends in, in repainting the eyes all the way up to the last um, layer. Turning our attention to treatment of sculptures, the main objective is mostly to recover the aesthetic unity of a work of art while respecting the object's authenticity as a creation and as a historical document. Treatment requires critical interpretation, judgment, and sensitivity from both curators and conservators. There's overall agreement that the sculpture over-restored looks wrong and that obliterating signs of age makes sculptures seem somewhat fake. Critical problems of conservation usually involve cleaning, removal of possible overpaints, and minimization of disturbances caused by losses. The cleaning of a sculpture can be truly transforming, especially for polychrome sculptures, which, as just demonstrated, have often been covered with layers of overpaint. Removal of these modern paint layers is undertaken only after consider considerable thought and research, the process being fundamentally irreversible. However, in certain cases, cleaning will reveal well-preserved original layers, offering detailed evidence of the original creative process. The cloister St. Barbara, that you see here, was treated at the cloisters in the 1970s and represents a case where overpainted layers could be removed to disclose an original polychromy in good, in good condition. The sculpture had already been treated in the past, possibly before entering the museum's collection in 1955. The black and white photo photography of the saint on the left represents an image prior to the first treatment, covered with dull paint layers. After this first treatment, most overpaints were removed, sparing the flesh tones on the saint's face and arms. The overpaints remaining on these flesh areas were a grayish layer covering original paint in good condition. In, in 1970, or in the 70s, conservation removed the gray layer on the flesh to disclose the original paint. On the left, you see a treatment half performed with the gray layer on the right and the exposed surface on the left. The, the treatment has brought all sections of the, of the sculpture to a single level, that of the saint's original polychromy. And here is a finished um, image of the, of the face of Saint Barbara after treatment. Uh, you see that these losses that I will speak about a, a little later um, have also been inpainted so as to so as to give a full view of the flesh without having this distraction of the loss. The cloister's 13th century Mosen and throne virgin and child is another example where overpaint removal was justified. The treatment was performed in Stuttgart, Germany in 2000, before the museum's acquisition of the sculpture. As would have been performed at the museum today, the sculpture was thoroughly analyzed to understand the painting materials and their layer structure, and allow secure identification of pigments, metal foils, and their sequence of application. Now, prior to restoration, the sculpture was in very poor condition. It was severely damaged by wood-eating insects. As you see these holes here, caused by wood-eating insects that disfigure the, the sculpture's volume. The sculpture had been painted at least three times in the past. The earliest complete overpaint was a Baroque layer, including the regilding of the Virgin's dress, this regilding, her crown, and a child's mantle. The lining on her mantle was repainted with azurite, and the outer mantle painted a red. The cushion's cover was overpainted a light gray paint. I see all the way up there. And flesh tones overpainted in the light browns. In the 19th century, the sculpture's base, child's hair, and virgin's crown were overpainted with a red lead paint. I see the red. Hmm. While losses in the gold were retouched with what is called bronzine, which is a granular imitation of gold. And it's probably in the 20th century that the whole sculpture was covered with a dark, dark brown glaze, you clearly notice on the left, at which time broken or lost hands of the virgin and child were added. This overall dark glaze was meant to disguise losses, disparities, and paint layers, 
and aim at unifying this cultural volume. One might say an early attempt at aesthetic unity. Since analysis revealed a well-preserved original 13th century polychromy, decision was made to remove the concealing layers of later paint. The exposed 13th century polychromy rekindled a sense of the sculpture's original aspects with a palette restricted to gold, blue, and red. Well-preserved 13th century paints are a rarity in the museum's collection, and the small object has become a precious window to that past. The faces in particular display pale blue-gray eyes, outlined in reddish brown, gilded eyebrows, and rosy cheeks painted wet on wet. The gowns of the Virgin, the gowns of the child and his mother are also in relatively good condition. On these, gold leaf was applied to a white ground and was decorated with black and red lines and simple florid patterns. The Virgin's cloak alone is poorly preserved and you see only fragments of red on the white ground. Here's fragments of red. Now, besides cleaning, the minimization of disturbances caused by losses can significantly alter a sculpture's appearance. The safest course of treatment is, in fact, to interfere with the object as little as possible. For the cloister's Mosin seated virgin and child, the, uh, the wear and abrasion from years of handling and or adulation has somewhat softened the sculptural volumes, the crests of the folds, the child's feet, polychromy on the left arm and thigh. Both virgin and child have lost one hand, and so these hands were removed. The losses and abrasions are readily comprehensible as the result of use and history of the object. No attempt at in-painting or reconstructing losses was performed on the sculpture. Formally, even historically and aesthetically, there's justification for leaving wear without compensation. However, in other cases, non-intervention affects the appearance and legibility of a work of art. The so-called Autin Virgin at, at the Cloisters, which is a 12th century enthroned virgin and child from Burgundy, France, was treated with the concern that losses were affecting the sculpture's legibility. There are obvious losses, such as the missing child's head, uh, three, three legs on the throne, here and the two back legs are also missing, and deteriorations on the sculpture's base. Most of the polychromy is, mi is missing. Um, the sculpture would have been originally um, multicolored in that the Virgin's mantle was this um, intense blue um, made with lapis lazuli. She would have had a green robe which was made with a dark green glaze over a, a white preparation so that the green glaze would have, would have reflected against this white base. Um, you have um, the mantle of Christ would have been an orpiment yellow, a very bright yellow and um, a red robe. So she would have been quite stunning but originally but here we already have, with all these losses, an enthroned, an enthroned virgin which exudes sculptural power. It's an amazing sculpture. In our general appreciation of the sculpture prior to treatment on the left, the point of focus remained the virgin's gaze, the absence of the second blue eye and a disfiguring scar or crack on her proper left cheek. Now, cracks in wooden sculptures are common as the wood here, birch, contracts in dry conditions and ultimately ca causing such disfigurations. So, this crack. The original eye is fashioned out of blue glass, um, as can be identified on the microscope as this um, blue form shape has bubbles and therefore is, cannot be a stone or a semi-precious stone. Now, a long discussion was initiated between curators and conservators to determine whether the crack should be filled and the missing eye replaced. The boundary between a successful compensation of a loss and an over-restored object was uh, quite fine. Decision was made to remodel the eye, the missing eye, in a material comparable in gloss and shape to the original eye and fill the crack to match the surrounding wood. 
The crack was consciously not filled up to the top of the virgin's crown so as to leave remnants of damage and avoid heaviness of volumes. So you see that the crack was filled all the way down, but then up from the hair up, it, it was left. Um, as, as I say, filling the crack probably would have made this a little too heavy volume for, for, this, for this culture. All elements used for the treatment can be easily removed, the modern eye plucked out, and the fill scooped out. The additions are documented on the object's label so as not to mislead the public. After treatment, the viewer is able to focus on the virgin's physiognomy, I believe, not on the disfiguring losses. Now to conclude, conservators are constantly caring for the museum's collection to maintain objects' condition, to improve their appearance when necessary for special exhibitions or when newly acquired. There is a continuing effort to present the museum's medieval polychrome sculptures in the best of light so as to extend knowledge and appreciation of these rare survivals of medieval art. The dialogue between conservators and curators has become essential to improve our understanding of what was intended by medieval artists and their patrons, as also of the ways in which sculptures were then adapted over succeeding centuries to changing taste and functions. Thank you.